morning, everyone. As you can see, I'm doing some arranging. <laughs> My name is Karen Dale. I am the person in ministry with this amazing faith community. And you haven't seen me for a while because I have been on holiday. Lucky me. <laughs> very, very fortunate. And I had a fantastic restful time. However, it is great to see all of you here in the sanctuary. Going to give a big wave for those people that are on Zoom. Oh, thank you for waving back. That's awesome. Really, really good. And I also want to say thank you to uh, Sandra Lawton, who is the lead of the spiritual practice team and the whole spiritual practice team for organizing the coverage for worship while I was away. That's a lot of work, and I'm very appreciative. Thank you. That was great. But we're back, and it's September, and things are off, and the first thing that's happening is the book event. I know. This is the third year, so it, it is becoming an annual event. And it's on Friday, starts on Friday afternoon and continues on Saturday. I have sent out a special email this morning that gives you uh, volunteer opportunities. So if you can help setting up during the week, then please have a look at that email. It gives you times and things to do. Also, as part of the book event is the cafe. Donna Smith is kind of the lead for that. So if you are able to help out with cookies or squares or, you know, make a loaf and chop it up, what, whatever it is that you can do, please contact Donna. And now we have Sue Baker, who is going to come up and make an announcement in person. Um, you can try. Uh, Sue, can you come up here just so that the uh, video can capture you as well? It just makes it um, easier for the tech team. Ta-da! <laughs> Here I am. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I noticed, actually, that this week it was not noted that Tuesday we have coffee. Um, last week it was. And there were a few of us here in uh, the chapel, <laughs> had to think about that, on Tuesday morning. And so I am warmly invite anybody to come and join us this Tuesday morning. We have resumed our Tuesday morning coffee, 1030 in the chapel. It's informal, just drop in, great chats. If you can hear, sometimes there's so many of us that it is difficult to hear each other because everybody's excited to be together. So I invite any of you who'd like to join us. Thanks. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you, Sue. So with all of those things kind of buzzing around in our heads, let's just take a breath. Let us center ourselves in the reason that we are here. We are searching for that sacred connection in our lives. And Barry is going to help us with some centering music.
You can see that the community candles are lit on our communion table at the front. We have the candle of our faith in Jesus, Jesus that we call the radical, and perhaps as we listen to the parable this morning, we will get a deeper understanding of that title of Jesus as radical that calls us to live love in the world. And we have the candle of affirmation, whose light draws the circle wide that says that every single person is welcome in this place. And then the candle of reconciliation, lighting the path to healing and mending those broken covenants. And the candle that celebrates our diversity, highlighting our commitment to become an intercultural church. So let us continue with our land acknowledgement where we acknowledge that the sacred land upon which this faith community operates is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. And it's now home to a diverse range of First Nations people of Métis and Inuit from all across Turtle Island. And we want to particularly honor our closest indigenous community, the Chippewas of Georgina Island. And so we acknowledge that this region operates on a territory that is subject to the Wampum Belt Covenant and the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, which means that we commit to peaceably sharing and caring for the resources that are all around the Great Lakes. something to try and do. So let us join our voices together now as we come together in our call to worship. I have the regular font, you have the bold. God of wonder, your stories whisper in the willows, they flow from pages of books and they beat within our hearts. God of justice and righteousness, your wisdom speaks truth and cuts through the lies. May we follow your way in worship and our lives. Let us continue with prayer. O oh God of infinite possibilities, the love that you have shown us in Jesus is so precious, more precious than gold. We know that your arms, O oh God, are open wide like a parent, waiting, waiting for their wayward children, ready to welcome, ready to restore. And we come to you now, maybe feeling a little weary from the journey, maybe rejuvenated from a time of rest, but we are all seeking renewal in your spirit. So may we breathe and drink of that spirit and be satisfied, ready to move on together, accompanying each other on the way. Amen. So let us sing, let us sing our first hymn together. It's in Voices United, 112. Oh God, how we have wandered. Ain't that the truth? <laughs>
We are continuing with a worship series that we started in July. It's about Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. And what I invited you to do is if you had a story that was particularly meaningful for you, let me know and we would focus on those stories. I thought during July, but there was a great response. So we're continuing it uh, during September. And, and the idea is to think about the stories that have had meaning for you, maybe have influenced you in some way. And so to center on that idea, we have been singing a scripture song. And you can probably guess what it is because you were probably there in July. But if you weren't, we're going to sing the first verse of Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. And please remain seated for this. So one of those people that responded was Ruth. Ruth has a parable that uh, she is going to share with us now. So thank you so much for sending me that email. And thank you for being present here this morning. Good morning. I'm not certain when I first heard the parable of the prodigal son. I believe it was sometime in my late childhood. But I have one clear memory I have from hearing that. I felt concerned for the faithful son. Now, the return of the wayward boy was a happy event, but the large celebration at his return seemed to overshadow the contribution of the older brother. No party or celebration had ever been held for him. He seemed to have been taken for granted. Now, over the years, many sermons have been preached about this parable. And if my memory is correct, and it's quite possible it's not, uh, the great focus was on the younger son, who was lost, now found, and forgiven. This, of course, is a central belief to our Christian faith and is a central uh, part of this parable. Now, on a personal note, this story has particular resonance for me. You see, my father was the faithful brother. He was the youngest brother, and he stayed home established a successful business in his home community and was always there to help out. His brother, the older brother, moved across the country to pursue a career. Unfortunately, after some time, he made some very poor choices and had to return back to his family jobless, where he would in time establish a new line of work. He was welcomed back by his family. In fact, I was very fond of him. This was not the problem. But I have always been left wondering about the contribution of the faithful son, who is so steady and dependable. And now I'm going to read now from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. <clears throat> Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons, his younger one said to his father, Father, give, my share, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. 
Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything there, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I'm starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you fill a cat, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with, with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. And it is wonderful to have the choir back. I know that some of you in and solos have been contributing your gifts throughout the summer. So thank you for that. I hope that you are well rested and in good voice. I've moved the candles back a little bit, so hopefully there will be space for you and the choir are going to share with us the anthem, Oh Holy Jesus, it's by Jonathan Wilcox.
Are you okay? Okay. Jackie's trying really carefully not to uh, jostle the mic. It's it's tricky. Well, you have answered the question. Yes, you are in absolutely splendid voice. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. So I, I'm going to take Ruth's lead. She has been thinking about the fact of what is the role of that older brother? How do we bring his contribution into this story? And to help me, that, um, I have gone to Amy Jill Levine. She is a person of Jewish faith, but she is a professor of the New Testament and she weaves Jewish studies into that at Vanderbilt University. And she's the author of a book that I know some of you have uh, looked at, um, The Short Stories by Jesus. I think the Shalom Seekers have looked at that book, haven't they, Anne? Yes, yeah. She uh, has been really helpful in grounding me in some different ways of looking at this parable. Because there's never one way of looking at things, is there? That's what makes this, for me anyway, so fascinating. And I hope I can bring you into my fascination with these ancient stories. So first off, let's think about the title that we know this story by. We know it as the parable of the prodigal son. But there are some alternative um, titles, and we'll get into that a little bit. But first of all, I want to share a little bit about Amy Jill Levine. She is described as subversive in her writing. In fact, one writer said that she is as subversive as any parable, which kind of shows us what, what the intent of those parable stories were for Jesus. He is trying to open up different possibilities for though all of those that hear it. So the reinterpretation is part of hearing a parable. And what Amy Jill does is help us focus on the Jewish, first century Jewish perspective. Basically, how were the listeners, Jesus' listeners, receiving that story? So that's an important part of the context. But she also challenges those of us that are in the Christian church to look at our assumptions to look at what we bring to these stories and to perhaps reconsider. So part of that is the title, The Prodigal Son. It is very unlikely that Jesus used that title. I would imagine he did have titles for his stories because he probably told them more than once. You know, he was moving around. I'm sure he told these stories a number of times. But the thing about this word prodigal is it means wasteful, which fits really well with the uh, younger son, as you've heard from Ruth. But it's a word that only appears in our language about 400 years after Jesus died. So it isn't a word that would have been in any of the languages at the time. And it comes into our biblical text when Jerome brings it in his um, interpretation of the biblical canon. And what that title does is shift our focus. It immediately makes us think, okay, we need to listen up to what the younger son is doing. That's what a title does, really. It focuses our attention. But this story starts... There was a man who had two sons. That's how the story starts. There are more than one character in th 
this story. And Ruth has been pondering from her family experience about the place of the loyal son, the one that stayed at home, the one that did everything that was expected of them. So if we name this parable differently, there's an opportunity, I think, to open things up and look at all the characters. So some religious scholars now are starting to call this story the parable of the prodigal son and his brother. Mm, okay. Amy Jill Levine is not that impressed with that title. She is suggesting something different. She says, how about the parable of the faithful older brother and his sibling. <laughs> but it turns it around, doesn't it? It immediately turns it around, which is exactly what Ruth is suggesting for us. So I don't know which title Ruth prefers, but I, I kind of like that one. But that there are other possibilities to think about. In the Coptic Christian church, so in the church that originated in Egypt, they have a different title altogether. They call it the lost son. And we are left to wonder, okay, so which of those sons is lost? Or maybe they're lost, both of them are lost in different ways. Again, it opens up the story. So for us as Christians, just embedded in that prodigal son, what does that do? It focuses us in on the younger son for sure, but it makes the story about basically somebody who's messed up. Somebody who's messed up and needs forgiving. And the idea is the loving father is God. And we are those people that mess up all the time that need forgiveness. And that's where Luke, who is the, uh, the writer of this particular story in the gospel of Luke, that's where he's going. He wants to focus on the idea of repentance. And right the way through his gospel, that is where <clears throat> his focus is. I'm not sure that really fits. I've looked and looked at this story, and I'm not convinced that that younger son repents at all. I think he says what he has to say to get what he wants. That's what I think. You might read it differently, which is fine. But at least in that sense, he's consistent <laughs> right from the first ask, right the way through to the end. And so what might the parable be talking about if we look at all the characters? Perhaps part of it is the importance of searching for what is lost. And we need to remember that partner stories to this parable. There are two other stories that go with it. The parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. All are about searching for something that is lost and then celebrating when it's found. So we heard about the party in our parable. There's definitely a celebration. And there is a sense that that family about the mother. The mother is not mentioned at all, but that family of a father and two sons have been restored. There's a coming together of what was separated, even for a short period of time. So let us think about the Jewish context. How would those people that were listening to Jesus telling this story, let us try and imagine how they might have heard that. As soon as they heard two brothers, they would have said, oh, I know where this is going. I know stories about two brothers, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, all of those, Isaac and Ishmael, 
there's lots of stories in Hebrew scriptures about two brothers. And in those stories, the younger son is the good son. You've got the righteous um, and faithful and clever. All of those are the younger sons. But in this parable, like many of the Jesus stories, he turns it around. And he makes the older son the good, faithful. Jesus is a great storyteller. He wants us to listen. He wanted the people at the time to listen. He isn't going to give them what they expect. And when you are surprised, you listen in a little bit more carefully, which is exactly what, what he wanted. So those people on hillsides or wherever they were hearing this story would not have connected particularly well with that younger son, with his wastrel ways, with him becoming a servant, having to work with the pigs. There are just so many things that they wouldn't have connected with. But then you've got a father a father who welcomes back his son. And for sure, that isn't a point of connection. I would think as the father was welcoming back his son, those people, those Jewish, first century Jewish people were connecting with the older son, the one that seemingly is being ignored right now. And the father doesn't seem to care what has happened with the younger son. He runs out, he hugs him, filled with compassion. There is a huge party that is planned. It seems almost like that rehearsed speech that the son had. The father doesn't even hear it. He is so thrilled to have his boy back. Now, perhaps that Jewish audience would have expected a more, a stronger response from the older son. They might even have expected some uh, physical violence. Yes, there is anger. There is deep anger and betrayal. But it's at this point in the story that I came to realize with the help of uh, a lot of writers that this is where the father leaves the party and he searches for his older son. He didn't search for his younger son. Yes, he watched and waited for his return. He celebrated his return. But he didn't go out of his way, in a sense, to search for his younger son, but that's exactly what he did with the older son. And if we're thinking about things lost, then this is an important part of the story. The father leaving the party and finding where his older son has gone. So we tend to think that this story ends with the feasting and the fancy clothes and the return. But actually, the story ends with a desperate father who wants to make his family whole. He, he intuits that his older son is distancing himself from the family, and he doesn't want that. So he goes after him. And they are in a field, father and son. And that's where the story ends. We don't know exactly what happened. That is the power of parables, because we can add our experience and our story into it, because they challenge us to do exactly that. Parables don't tell us exactly what to do. They invite us into the story and we have to make it our own. What is it in our life experience that we need to make whole again? Who or what is it that we need to welcome back into our lives or be open to an invitation from others to be a part of their lives? So take the time to celebrate, share 
joy and possibly that might help prevent some of the disconnects and losses. Don't wait to receive an apology. <laughs> you might never get it, <laughs> but still try and make that connection. We all know when we're uh, not so happy with th those people that are closest to us and we think, oh, you know, they should apologize. Well, maybe, maybe not. But let's still keep and holding on to that relationship. And what about forgiveness? That's held up high, isn't it? That we need to forgive when things have wrongdoing has happened to us. Maybe there are times when forgiveness isn't possible. But reconnecting might be on some, some level or other. So what can we do? Go to lunch with people. Every possibility you have. I tend to think of all the reasons why I can't do whatever because I can't fit it in or blah, blah, blah. Get rid of those. Make it a priority in our lives to connect with people in whatever way that that is. It's really, really important if we are reaching for a sense of wholeness, not just in ourselves, but in our personal relationships and in our community. Now, I'm the older sibling in my family. <laughs> Rod's going, mm, we know that. <laughs> yeah, because there are characteristics, aren't there? Uh, it might not apply to everybody, but I think there are characteristics of, of different places uh, in the family. So I, I've tended to be the one that is um, takes my responsibilities seriously. So my brother has a, a different approach to life. And that's, that's okay. <laughs> you know, there, there are times when I've been a bit frustrated um, with, with his way of being, but it's just a different way of being. I'm, I'm trying to kind of let go with that. Now, there, there is a, an ocean between us. So <laughs> you know, that, that can help as well sometimes. But if you think about your role in, in your family and families that are ever changing, they're not static. There's all sorts of things that we can learn from that experience, that deepening of relationships there that often comes with sharing hardships. It often comes after those bumps in the road, those things that have not gone so well. And then there's a whole lot of laugh along the way, isn't there? The, the joy of telling those stories back and we can actually laugh at each other and the whole atmosphere changes. And I think for me, that's what I get out of this parable right now at this time in my life is that sense of how important it is to come together to try and reconcile in some way. It might not be an apology, it might not even be forgiveness, but how do we bring a sense of wholeness into our lives? How do we recover what is lost? We need to name the importance of what is lost and how do we reintegrate that into our lives. Because I think when we do that, when we become more whole, you know, whole together, that is one of the steps towards living in peace. And we're going to get into that a little bit more next Sunday. Uh, Rod and I are going to be reflecting on a different parable a parable that takes us into, okay, so what? how do we have this sense of wholeness and peace wider than our families, wider than into the world? And before I stop talking, I need to recognize that there are times 
when there is, it's not possible to reclaim what is lost. Where what was can never be again. So this is not a, you have to do it every time. It's, let's think about what might be lost and is there a chance of creating wholeness? And wholeness might be created by letting go of things. I, I say that a lot. So it is never one way or the other. And that is why I, I love the title of this next hymn. God of still waiting, that sense of not a God who is proclaiming what we should and shouldn't do, but a God who is waiting for us to name the things that are important in our lives, waiting for us to shape our lives and be there with us. So let us sing together this hymn. God of Still Waiting. It's a More Voices. That's the Spiral Bound um, hymn book, and it's number 20. We now move into our time of offering. And yes, I encourage you to offer monetary offerings if you are able. That is the way that we continue to support this faith community and all the things that it does. But there's a whole lot more to offering. There is offering our time, offering our gifts, offering our prayers. There are so many ways that we can give to this faith community. So I invite you to reflect on some of those ways that might fit for you in your life as our offerings are now received.
Please be seated. And I invite uh, Bruce, who is going to come up and lead us in the prayers of the people. And before he starts, I would just like to say thank you. We have some new people who are part of leading the prayers. Bruce is one of them, and you will hear Sandra Lawton as well. So thank you. <laughs> Friends, let us come together in prayer. Loving Creator, we are grateful for your caring embrace as we navigate transitions at this time of year. Children, young people, and their educators returning to the classroom, anticipating the conclusion of summer and the arrival of autumn as we put away our outdoor furniture and dust off our rakes in anticipation of the leaves that will soon fall. As individuals, many of us find ourselves in transition in some cases, such transition is by choice. A new relationship, a new hobby, a new home, a new career. And in particular, we follow with great interest the journey of Ian Wilgus as he strives to become an ordained minister, and we remain willing to support him on his journey. In other cases, change has chosen us. Challenges to our health financial difficulties, the loss of a loved one. But amid all such transitions, members of our congregation, guided by the loving example of Jesus, dedicate our energies, care, and compassion to one another. Outside the doors of this sanctuary, food insecurity and homelessness afflict increasing numbers of our neighbors. Loving God, Give us the means to support those organizations, both within and beyond our HUC, that help, that aim to help those around us who are in need. Yet farther afield, events in the world, often turbulent, give us pause. Continued conflict in the Middle East and Ukraine, unprecedented human upheaval and suffering in Sudan, the increased popularity of far-right political parties in Germany and elsewhere. For those who are adversely affected by these circumstances, we offer our prayers for protection and peace and a return to a sustainable and dignified way of life. Dear God, at this time, we bring to you our concerns and perhaps even our fears for ourselves, for our family and friends, whether they are sitting beside us here this morning or whether they are a continent away. And we pray that you extend your loving embrace to each one of them. Let us now say, the words that Christ taught us.
indwelling God, belowing spirit, infused throughout all existence. We honor you with many names. Your spirit is within the human heart. We accept life for all that can be. On earth as throughout creation. May we continue to draw sustenance from this earth. May we receive forgiveness equal to our own. May we move from separation toward union to live in grace with love in our hearts forever and ever. Amen. Him, a voice is united six two five. I heard the voice of Jesus say. And you can see that we are setting up for our hospitality time in the sanctuary. We are ser we. <laughs> the wonderful volunteers are serving coffee with no help from me whatsoever, so we will not make it a we. So there is going to be coffee if you're feeling a little bit cool, but we will be staying in the sanctuary because Centennial Hall has a lot of books. <laughs> and we don't want you peeking at them. <laughs> Come on Thursday and Friday for that. So let us sing one to another our blessing. If you can stay for um, a coffee and some conversation, that would be great. But in the meantime, let us sing one to another, love us into fullness.
Go in peace.